What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome to our 10th example video following our course on differential equations. Now today's video is going to be on second order linear homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients. So let's go ahead and get into our examples for today's video. Okay, so all of today's examples are gonna be dealing with the same theorem, which I've written out here in our definitions. And so basically what we're gonna be doing is finding the roots of the characteristic polynomial, which is just a quadratic. And based on the information we get from that, whether we have two real roots or one repeated root or two imaginary roots, we're gonna have different ways to express the general solution of our differential equation. So let's go ahead and read this theorem. So if we let P of R equal AR squared plus BR plus C be the characteristic polynomial of AY double prime plus BY prime plus CY equals zero, then we have the following. If P of R has distinct real roots, R1 and R2, then the general solution of our differential equation is Y equals C1 times E to the power R1 times X plus C2 times E to the power R2 times X. If P of R has a repeated root R1, then our general solution is Y equals E to the power R1 times X times C1 plus C2X. And finally, if P of R has complex roots R1 equals lambda plus I omega and R2 equals lambda minus I omega with omega greater than zero, then the general solution to our differential equation is Y is equal to E to the power lambda X times C1 times the cosine of omega X plus C2 times the sine of omega X. So now that we've gone over the theorem that we're gonna use for these problems, let's go ahead and get into a simple example. So number one says, find the general solution for the following differential equation, y double prime minus four y prime plus four y is equal to zero. Now finding the characteristic polynomial for this differential equation is very easy. You just take the coefficients from the differential equation and equate them to the coefficients in a similar quadratic. So we have p of r is equal to r squared minus four r plus four. So next, all we need to do is very simple algebra and find the roots of this quadratic. But we can see that this factors as r minus two quantity squared, which means our roots are r equals two. And because we're in the case where we have a repeated root, we know that our general solution is going to be y is equal to e to the two x times c one plus c two x. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So number two says, find the general solution for the following equation. So we have y double prime minus 4y prime plus 5y. So let's go ahead and write out our characteristic polynomial. So we have p of r is equal to r squared minus 4r plus 5. Now because we did our previous problem, we can see that this is just 1 plus our previous characteristic polynomial. So we'll have r squared minus 4r plus 4 plus 1 which is of course equal to r minus two quantity squared plus one, which gives us the following complex roots for this characteristic polynomial. We have r one is equal to two plus i, and r two is equal to two minus i. And it's easy to see those are roots if you plug them into the equation above and see that it will equal zero. So now that we have our roots, we can write out our general solution. We will have y is equal to e to the power of lambda x, and our lambda is just the coefficient of the real part here, so we'll have e to the two x, and that's gonna be times c1 times the cosine of omega x, but our omega is the coefficient of the imaginary part, which in this case is one, so we will ha just have cosine of x, and then we'll have plus C2 times the sine of omega x, which is of course just x here. So that's our general form for this differential equation. So now that we've gotten some simple examples out of the way, let's move on to some more difficult initial value problems so we can solve for these constants. So for number three, we want to find the general solution for the following equation and then use the initial conditions to solve for our C1 and C2 to get a final answer. So let's go ahead and write out our characteristic polynomial for this second order differential equation. So we all have P of R is equal to R squared plus six R plus five. And we can see that that will factor as R plus five times R plus one, which of course means that we have the following roots. We have R one is equal to negative five and R two is equal to negative one which will give us the general solution by our formula. We will have y is equal to c1 times e to the negative five x plus c2 times e to the negative x. 
Now recall, we have conditions for y evaluated at zero, but we also have a condition for y prime evaluated at zero, so we're gonna to need to take the derivative of this in order to apply our second condition, so let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go ahead and derive our y prime. So taking the derivative of that first term is just gonna give us negative five c1 times e to the negative five x. And the derivative of that second term is just gonna give us a negative, so we'll have negative c2 times e to the negative x. So now we can apply our initial conditions. Let's go ahead and write those down. We have y evaluated at zero is equal to three, and we have that y prime evaluated at zero is equal to negative one. So let's go ahead and apply this first one first. So we'll have y evaluated at zero equals three, so we have three is equal to c1 plus c2. As plugging in a zero for our exponents for those e's will make them go away. And then let's go ahead and use our second condition on our second equation here. And we will have, let's see, we'll have negative one is equal to, well similarly when we plug in our zero for x, those e terms will go away and we'll be left with negative five c1 minus c2. So now we want to solve for our c1 and c2, and we have two equations and two unknowns. So let's start by solving for our c1 by adding these two equations. So let's add them up, and if we do that, these c2s will cancel, and we'll be left with 2 is equal to negative 4c1, which of course means that c1 is equal to negative 1 half. And since we know c1 is equal to negative 1 half, we can plug that into our first equation. We'll have 3 is equal to negative 1 half, plus c2, which of course means that our c2 is going to be equal to seven halves. So we can go ahead and plug that into our formula for our equation. Uh, to get our final answer, we will have that y is equal to, well let's see, we'll have negative one half times e to the negative five x plus seven halves times e to the negative x as our final answer. So let's go ahead and get to our fourth problem where we use a different part of this theorem. So for number four, we're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. We wanna find the general solution for this equation and then use our initial conditions to solve for our constants and get our final answer. So our differential equation for this problem is y double prime plus six y prime plus nine y is equal to zero. So let's go ahead and write out our characteristic polynomial for this equation. We will have p of r is equal to r squared plus six r plus nine. And quite obviously that will factor as r plus three quantity squared, which means we have a repeated root. So that means we can express y using our repeated root formula. We will have y is equal to e to the negative three x times c1 plus c2 times x. Now just like before, we have two initial values, one for regular y and one for y prime, so we're gonna to wanna to take the derivative of this so we can apply our second given initial value. So in order to derive y prime, we're going to have to use the product rule here, so let's go ahead and take the derivative of that first thing first. So we will have negative three times e to the negative three x, times what we have in the parentheses there, c1 plus c2 times x, and that will be plus the derivative of what's in the parentheses times e to the negative three x, but if we take the derivative of what's in those parentheses, we'll be left with just c2, so we'll have c2 times e to the negative three x. So now we can apply our initial values to this, so we have that y evaluated at zero is three, and y, eva y prime evaluated at zero is negative one. So if we plug a three into y and a zero into x for our first equation, we will get that three is equal to c1, as all the other terms will cancel out when we plug in our zero. And that means that we can use that value for c1 when we plug into our second equation there and find our c2 right away. So our condition for y prime is that y prime evaluated at zero is equal to negative one. So let's see what we'll get if we plug that in. So we'll get negative one is equal to, so plugging in our values to that First term there, we'll get negative three times one as e to the zeroth power is one times, well we already know our value for c1 and that is three, so times three and that second term will cancel out. So we'll just get negative three times three and then that's going to be plus, well that e term will go to one as well, so we'll just have c2. So from here we can easily see our value for c2 as we'll have negative nine plus c2 is equal to negative one. If we add that negative nine over, we will get that c2 is equal to eight. So let's go ahead and plug our values for C1 and C2 into this equation to derive our final formula for Y here. So we'll have Y is equal to E to the negative three X times C1, which is three plus eight times X. So that is our final answer for this initial value problem. 
So let's go ahead and move on to our last example where we will do one with complex roots. So number five says find the general solution for the following equation, then use the initial conditions to solve for C1 and C2. Well, this time our differential equation is y double prime plus 4y prime plus 13y is equal to 0. And then we have the initial conditions y of 0 is equal to 2 and y prime of 0 is equal to negative 3. So let's go ahead and write out our characteristic polynomial. We will have that p of r is equal to r squared plus 4r plus 13. So normally you might take some time trying to see if this factors or you could just use the quadratic formula. But usually I like to check to see if I can spot a perfect square right away because if you do that it's very easy to pick out the complex roots. And it is in fact easy to spot a perfect square by rearranging this. So we can write this as r squared plus 4r plus 4 plus 9. And this part right here will contribute a r plus 2 quantity squared. And they'll be left with a plus 9 out here. Now you might say from here, well, how do I spot the complex roots? Well, it's rather easy. The coefficient of our real part of the root, or our lambda, is going to have to cancel out this plus 2 here. And our the coefficient of the imaginary part, our omega, is going to have to cancel out this plus 9 here. So in order to cancel out that plus 2, we'll need a negative 2 for our real part. And then in order to cancel out that 9, we will need a 3i. So that's our r1. And then our r2 will be equal to negative 2 minus 3i. So if you want to plug those in to check to make sure they're roots, you can. But I think this is a neat little trick that might save you some time instead of doing the quadratic formula. So now that we have our r1 and r2, we can use our formula to find our y with complex roots. So we will have that y is equal to e to the power of our lambda times x. So our lambda is negative 2x. And that's going to be times c1 times the cosine of omega times x. And our omega is 3 in this case, so we will have 3x plus c2 times the sine of omega x, which is still 3x. So that is our general solution to this differential equation. And now we want to use our initial values in order to solve it. So let me go ahead and write those out. We will have y evaluated at 0 is equal to 2. And we have that y prime evaluated at 0 is equal to negative 3. So let's go ahead and derive our y prime by taking the derivative of this thing using the product rule. So we'll have y prime is equal to, well, let's take the derivative of the first term. We'll have negative 2e to the negative 2x times what's in our parentheses there, c1 cosine 3x plus c2 sine of 3x. And then we need to add the derivative of what's inside the parentheses times e to the negative 2x. So let's see what we'll get if we take the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. Well, if we take the derivative of cosine, we'll get negative sine. So we'll have negative c1 sine of 3x. If we take the derivative of sine, we will get a positive cosine. So we'll get plus c2 times the cosine of 3x. And we will pick up a 3 from both of those trigonometric terms, which we can pull out from both of them. So we'll get 3 times e to the negative 2x. So let's go ahead and use our initial conditions now to solve for our c1 and c2. Let's start with y evaluated at 0 is equal to 2. So plugging those into our first equation, we will get 2 is equal to, well, e to the 0 power is 1. So we'll have 1 times c1 times the cosine of 3 times 0. But the cosine of 3 times 0 is just 0. So the cosine of 0 is 1. So we'll have c1. And the sine of 0 is 0. So we'll have plus 0, which of course tells us that c1 is equal to 2. Now we want to use our second initial condition, y prime evaluated 0 is negative 3. So we will have negative 3 is equal to, well, let's see. If we plug in 0 to our e power there, we'll get negative 2 times 1, which is just negative 2. And that's going to be times what's in those parentheses there. Well, we'll have c1, which we know to be 2. So 2 times the cosine of 3x, which is just 1, because x is equal to 0 in this case. So we'll have 2 plus c2 times the sine of 3x, but the sine of 3x when x is equal to 0 is just the sine of 0, which is 0. So we'll have plus 0. And then we'll have, for our second term, we'll have plus well, if we plug in 0 to our e, we'll just be left with a 3 on the outside. So we'll have 3 times, well, just like before, our sine term will cancel out. And we'll be left with c2 times the cosine of 3x, or just c2. So that'll give us c2 there. So that gives us our final equation for c2. We will have negative 3 is equal to negative 4 plus 3c2. And we can add that 4 over, and we'll get that 1 is equal to 3c2, which of course tells us that c2 is equal to 1 over 3. So we can plug those values for c1 and c2 back into our formula, and we'll get that y is equal to e to the negative 2x.
times two times the cosine of three x plus one over three times the sine of three x for our final answer. And that finishes off our fifth and final problem. And I think that's a good place to stop.